DJ Fat Tony, welcome to the studio. Hi, welcome. Hi. Um, I want to start by talking about the name Fat Tony and where it came from. Where my name came from? I used to be fat. It's quite simple. I was like a fat kid. Like uh, when I was about 14 to about 17, I got really fat. Um, and the name was one of those names that people always said behind my back. They was like, you know, Fat Tony, but never said it to my face. Because, you know, I was kind of a, a force to be reckoned with when I was young. I was really in your face. So, yeah, it just stuck around. And people always say now, why are you called Fat Tony? You think it's fat? It's just like, fuck off. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's my name. Just fuck off. Stop trying to tell me what to do. You could change it. No. Yeah, right. <laughs> you just kind of reclaimed it at the time. Yeah, of course. I own it. Yeah. It's good. And so during this time, you were 16 around this um, kind of Fat Tony phase. When did it become this DJ moniker? Uh, I kind of started DJing at 17. So I, uh, I kind of was just like, I got kicked out of school at 14 and then started working in a place called the Great Gear Market in King's Road. And King's Road in those days was like, uh, God, that's awful, those days. Uh, <laughs> King's Road was like, Facebook, King's Road was social media. People would walk up and down the King's Road all day to be seen. Mm. And it was a real nucleus of, of, of st style and fashion. And I kind of, I worked there and then I, it was a, a progression from there to go clubbing. And I worked on the door of a club called, called The Playground, which was for Steve Strange and Rusty Egan. And I worked on the door and every week I'd say, no, oh, the music's shit. The music's fucking crap. And one week they were like, well, why don't you do it then? And I was like, so I turned up the next week with like five records. And that was it. And then that was the start of me being a DJ. It was never something I wanted to do. Yeah. So it wasn't something you wanted to do? No. I had no goals. Partying was what I wanted to do. Going out and having fun was what I wanted to do. And suddenly I was getting paid to go out and have fun. So it was like, okay, it was the perfect, perfect job. But you had a passion for music from a young age. Uh, always, you know, I uh, I come from a quite a musical background. My gr grandmother was a classical pianist, and a great grandmother was a classical pianist. Uh, so, music's always been this. But you know, I've always loved, you know, <clears throat> music. Always, I love it. Anything that gets you emotionally and takes you on a journey, and that's what music does. Mm. And kind of on the, how did you get to be on the door of the playground? Because I've got a big mouth. <laughs> Literally, I remember, say, I remember going to Rusty and saying to him, oh, you opening a new club, aren't you? And he was like, yeah. I said, I'm opening one the same night. And he was like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, who cares? You know I mean? But he was like, oh, well, why don't you come and work for us? And then that was it. It's like, you know, like anything, I just blagged my way in. Total gift of the gab. Yeah, always. Do you get what I mean? Don't ask, you don't get, right? And is that something you had throughout your childhood, always this kind of total confidence? No, that's just it. It's not confidence. It's the opposite. Got it. I suffer from severe anxiety. I, I suffer from se severe low self-esteem, and, and especially in later life when, I, when my addiction took over, that come, all of that stuff comes from having low self-esteem and it buys into low self-esteem. Mm. So my mouth's always been a front. It's always been like, OK, I'm going to be the loudest person in the room, therefore you won't approach me. I'm going to be the scariest person, therefore you won't know how to approach me. So it's always been a barrier, do you know what I mean? But people always think that it's, oh, he's really forthcoming and he's like, you know, he's very cocksure and full of himself and it's not the case. It's a defence mechanism. Yeah, 100%. Which is a great thing to have, because it's, it's, it's been a, an, a, major, a major set of keys. It's mm. opened so many doors. But at the same time, it's, it's shut so many doors, <laughs> which I don't mind. Tip for tat. Tip yeah, for tat. fuck it. <laughs> what you see is what you get, right? Or, what, or should I say, what you hear is what you get. Yeah. <laughs> so at this point, you're still just 17, uh -huh. um, being a doorman. But before that, I've, got, I've kind of read some references that you're doing kind of styling with Michael Roberts and being... Oh, you know, yeah, no, I... I so basically, back what happened was... <laughs> So, Lynn Franks was kind of running London fashion back in the 80s, and uh, she was a massive PR guru, and I kind of got, like, taken under her wing. And so, there was, like, one season where I did everybody's music for their shows, from Catherine Hamnett, Wendy Dagworthy, Joseph, Joseph Trico. Uh, I was doing everyone's music. And um, 
Michael was always the stylist for it, and, uh, for, especially for Joseph. Mm. And Michael brought me on board. I was in, uh, what, what it was, I was in um, San Lorenzo uh, on, a, on a Friday night, and I was eating, and on the next table was Robert Forrest, Joyce, and he was on with Michael Roberts, and he was like, oh my God, you've got to meet this DJ. And then they were like, oh, well, we're doing a show, would you like to do the music? That's how it happened. Wow. And I was like, yeah, of course. So uh, the next day I went and did the music for, it was for Joseph, the, the, like the season show. And then, then I got taken under Lynn's wing. And then it was like, it just all stemmed from there. So yeah, I was always working. Because of the King's Road, I was always working within fashion already. So you're already kind of picking up people from the King's Road, yeah. rubbing shoulders with the right people. Yeah, well, I mean, all those people used to go down the King's Road. Do you get what I mean? As I say, that was social media. So a Saturday afternoon in the King's Road, you would have Riff at Osbeck, you would have everybody walking up and down. You know, that's what people did. It's hard to believe it was so organic. I know, right? But, it, you know, that was the 80s for you. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so what age are you at this point where you're already DJing for quite a few brands and then Joseph? Uh, 17, 18. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That young already? Yeah, I was I was really young, and I, I did a uh, one season we did a uh, for Joseph. I did uh, Dusty Springfield with Michael Roberts, and uh, we we did we based the whole show around uh, the Dusty's "You Don't Have to Say You Love Me" and "Chain Reaction" by Donna Ross, and the whole show was based on that. And we were going to get a drag queen to come out at the end and do Dusty. And uh, I remember being with Michael and Joseph, and he was like, when we were like compiling it all, and he was like. There's only one person who can do Dusty, and I was like, who? And he was like, you. And I was like, <laughs> so of course, you know, the, the chance to put on a pair of heels and, and be in drag. Yeah, you know, I did it, you know. That's amazing. Which was fun. Yeah. So where are you living at this time? Are you living base, base down in Kings Road? Because I know you're based... Oh, I was living in Battersea. Battersea. Just over Chelsea Bridge, yeah. Yeah. Still with family, or you'd moved Yeah, up? I mean, I was very fortunate that my mum and dad had a house in Battersea just by Lavender Hill. So it was like five minutes to the Kings Road, you know. I was kicked out of school at 14. I didn't have a choice. I had to go and do something because mm -hmm. my dad always thought I was going to school every morning. Because I mean, my dad was six foot four with hands, like fingers like bananas. So, you know, there wasn't a law of being kicked out of school for sucking off a drama teacher wasn't really going to go down well, was it? <laughs> do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So you porcupied to him the whole time and were going yeah. down the King's Road. Yeah. When did he find out? Did he? Uh, he kind of found out. You know what, I don't know what he found out, actually. I kind of think it just kind of, just, it was an organic process of just like, okay, he's not going to school anymore. Do you know what I mean? I think there was far more greater things happening yeah. at that point in our lives than he was worrying about me going out of the house every morning. You're already pretty successful at this point anyway. I mean, you know, I was leaving the house and drag and stuff like that. I kind of <laughs> think that was kind of more important to him. That kind of freaked him out more than me, you know. He never ever found out about me sucking off the drama teacher and getting a spell for it. That's good. Um, so, when did the kind of drug abuse kick in? Because were you drinking from a young age? Oh, I, I, you know, because I, I come from like a long line of, of, it's in my family. Like my dad was an alcoholic early on, and his father and, and my dad's brothers and sisters. Mm. So it's always been in our wiring, and I grew up as a, in that in a house where my dad would drink at the weekends and there, there would be major drama going on, you know, he'd beat my mum up. And I grew up in that environment and I always swore that I would never, ever drink, but I'm never gonna end up like my dad. And I had this auntie called Auntie Jenny and I was obsessed. She was an alcoholic, but she was like, one of those alcoholics that would lay on the grass hill by our house like, and throw bottles, empty bottles of woodpecker cider at buses. I loved her. I was just drawn to that energy. Yeah. And I kind of think it was like, you know, what I was drawn to was who I am because, you know, that's in my wiring, that addiction. So I, when I was working in the King's Road, I would go to the Chelsea Potter after work with everyone and start drinking. And I would always be the last to leave. I was always being the one that was just drunk into blackout. Um, and then suddenly, when I started working in clubs and going to clubs, it wasn't until I was about 18 that I first took my first drug. Mm. Um, bearing in mind, you know, it, it, it was cocaine and someone's like, oh, drink this, it, snort this, it will make you, you can, it will keep you awake and you can drink more. And I was like, oh, an aid to drinking? How, how apt? <laughs> uh, you know, and kind of, I hated it. I 
hated the feeling. Yeah. I hated the, 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 the fact that it made me feel paranoid. I hated all of that. But the week, next week, did it again. And then before you knew it, I was doing it every day. Yeah. But it's so, it's so of that time, I think everyone in that scene was quite consumed by it too. Well, I think they're more so, I come from the era of smack. Mm. So most of, the, most of my, my um, peers at that time were, had a heroin ad, ad addiction. Right. You know, heroin got London by the balls, like G has today on the gay scene. Heroin had everybody in its grips at that point in time. Every, every club promoter, everyone around, most of the fashions, everyone was on heroin. And I was quite proud of the fact that I, was, I had a coke problem because it was like I was the only one still awake. They'd all be gouging out. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a real major epidemic. But thankfully at that point in time, which I find quite hard to say, that I, I did have a coke problem and not heroin problem. Mm. I used to always like glorify the fact that I never ever did heroin. I used to free base opium of tinfoil, but yeah, that wasn't smack because it was a different name. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. And this is in this amazing kind of period of time. Um, it's such a high energy, almost like a fearlessness in that decade. Mm. And you are surrounded by some incredible people. I mean, this interview is definitely going to be a name dropping session because there's Boy George and Kate and Naomi and such an amazing group. Kim of Jones. People. Kim Jones. Kim later. Oh, you know, oh, that, uh, you know. John Galliano, John Flett, that all the people that have, there's so many people that came from that amazing era that paved the way for today's fashion. You know, some of them are the greats. Some of them come from that era. You know, and I truly believe it's the most, probably one of the most creative eras of, our, of especially of our generation and the next, I would imagine. Because the reason it was so creative is because we, we had no distractions. Mm. We didn't have something in our hand that we need to look at every three seconds. We didn't have something that we could press so that other people could blow smoke up our arse. We didn't have that. Mm. So what we had to do was we had to go out and get that. We had to go out and do something to get smoke blown up our asses. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think that had an awful lot to do with why so many geniuses come from that time. There's such an energy, I feel, and uh, this kind of fearlessness, particularly at some of the clubs like the Blitz or the Wag. I'm too young for the Blitz. <laughs> <laughs> the Wag was mine. I, I, I run the Wag on a Saturday night called Fat at the Wag and then we had Fatitude at the Wag. We, we, we did it for nine years and uh, I remember just like the chaos that we used to cause on that door. There was a curtain on the bottom of Wardour Street and we'd, we wouldn't let people in if they were on drugs but we'd be behind the curtain doing drugs. And like, it was just like, yeah, you know, but the clubs at that time, Taboo, Taboo was, you know, people go on about how amazing Taboo was. Taboo was really short-lived. Mm. It was a really small amount of time. There were so many other amazing clubs that really don't get uh, the, you know, the accolade that they should, like, you know, Kinky Linky, which was Michael Costas, which was an incredible. It's what RuPaul Drag Race is, was done back in those days on a mass scale. You know, there was so much energy and so, mi so much creativity. You know, you don't get that kind of creativity even at Halloween these days. Mm -mm. You know, you try and get someone to dress up. So, oh, you've got to dress up. They're like, oh, I can't be bothered. <laughs> I'd rather go to Primark and get some 16 outfits for 40 quid, you know. It's also about celebrating the individual, I think, as yeah, well. Yeah, 100%, you know. There were tribes back then. We don't have tribes today. We have gangs. Mm. They're totally different. Very different. And how did that kind of affect you being around all this amazing creativity? Like you say, it's just not commonplace these days, but to have that kind of energy, that creativity. I, to, to be honest, I was kind of like, um, I kind of like fell in, felt quite inadequate at times. Mm. I quite felt a less than. Because there's so many of my friends were like diver being pop stars or being designers or being stuff and then there was me being a DJ. Yeah, I, I was consumed by what I was doing. Mm. I was consumed by the drugs, I was consumed by the partying. You know, we did a documentary a couple of weeks ago, me and George, which is coming out in a couple of weeks of um, time with with Mixed Mag and, um, you know, George said in it that uh, when everybody else was off building brands, Tony was off partying. 
And it was true. Mm. Didn't care about building a brand, building a name for myself. But it, I kind of just think that, you know, it was, um, I didn't know what I wanted. That's the truth of it, you know. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, I was having a good time when most of those other people weren't. Mm. You kind of had this amazing um, feeling where you're saying yes to everything. Mm. You get to go to New York when you're, and when you're 18. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'd literally play, as I said before, I, I, that week that I played those five records at uh, the playground, two weeks later I was running a club on, with Stephen Leonard uh, um, on a Tuesday night called Total Fashion Victim at the WAG. Uh, and from that, I was in New York every month. I was working, for, going over, working for the Palladium. Yeah, was, you know, Studio 54 had just closed. They'd opened this brand new club called the Palladium. And Steve, Steve Rubell used to fly me over. And it was just like, you know, he, and I, 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 I was like 18. I was flying on Concord. What the fuck was that about? Do you know what I mean? It's insane. It's but at the time, didn't really give a fuck about it because all I cared about was, oh my god, I'm going to New York for a party, and I would, and and I wasted so much of that time being wasted. Mm. Yeah, I don't. It's really hard to remember half of it. The bits that I can remember, I sort of kind of don't want to discuss with a lot of people. <laughs> you know, because it's kind of like because it's about other people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't mind talking about myself. <laughs> What were you doing in New York as well as kind of DJing at the Palladium? You yeah, I was know. DJing at the Palladium once a month. I was going over, hanging out with, you know, I, I, I literally spent so much time over there. Sam McKnight was living there at the time and uh, all those young models like uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Furlow and there were so many of them. They all lived together in these houses and, and it was like, I was like, literally would fly over it once a month and just hang out mm. for two weeks at a time. I was doing just like I'm told, e ecstasy had just come on the scene. So I was kind of like, okay, I've just found my feet. I've, I've just found where I need to be on ecstasy 24 hours a day. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Off my nut on MDMA. Yeah. And, uh, and New York was just amazing in those days. It was just like everything, you know. It's not like it is today. No. There were so many incredible clubs. There was so much creativity. There was, you know, you had the meatpacking district where the, tran the trans girls hung out, the hookers, and would go down there in the middle of the night and antagonise them and make them laugh. And there was just so much different things to do. Mm. And I just loved it. Yeah. I was completely in awe of it. And, you know, and then Nell's opened. I started working there for them which was another club which was run by Little Nell, who used to, who was in Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm. She opened it like a private members thing. Um, so I, I kind of did a stint for them. Yeah. And then it all went pear-shaped. No, didn't. <laughs> You're really at the nucleus of all this amazing creativity, like Keith Haring in New York. Yeah. And... Keith, I mean, I, I loved Keith. I still do love Keith. I, you know, I, I hate talking about people in past tense, but you know, they're not, the, the thing about it is they're no longer here, but they are. Because mm. I probably talk about Keith three times a week. Because I see Keith. I see Keith's work. And, and that's the beauty of that creativity, that's, of that enormous personality that lives on in all of us. And, you know, Keith was, uh, I loved him. He didn't give a fuck. He didn't give a fuck. And, you know, I went to Paradise Garage real night with him. And I was just like, oh, my God. I thought I was bad. And this guy was just like, <laughs> off the scale. He was, yeah. yeah. Every black man in every corner is amazing. That is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you know, I got out to hang out with Warho, who was a complete and utter boring cunt, uh, to say the least. And, you know, his work was amazing. Well, the work that he actually did himself. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, uh, hanging out with people like that. I was 17 I really didn't give a fuck. Mm. They were lucky to hang out with me was my, in my head. Do you get what I mean? So at this point, you're kind of, there's a lot of MDMA flowing. <laughs> How are you getting these albums? How's your DJ sets flowing when you're this? Well, they, you know, for me, DJing on, on, on drugs was like, you know, at that point in time, you know, I, I thought I was the bollocks. I really thought I was the bollocks. You know, I remember this one time I went to, flew in to do a party at Palladium and I arrived and my friends were at the airport and they had like a, 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 
a cardboard sign saying, with my name, welcome to New York, with a bag of MDMA sellotape to it at the airport. And I came through and I was like, oh my God, hi guys. So I dropped the MDMA at the airport and then literally an hour later, we went to the club and I remember being behind the decks and I was like, it's not working, it's not working. By this time, I probably had about four capsules. I was like, it's not working, give me another one. They were like, no, I was like, give me another one. <laughs> so I remember dro dropping another one and uh, I bent down to get a record and I came back up like Cookie Monster. I was like, and I was like, I've got to leave. And they were like, what? I said, I've got to leave. And I literally played two records. I was like, I've got to get out of here. And they were like, you? I was like, I put the record on and walked out of the club. And I remember the next afternoon getting a phone call and they were like, oh my, and I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm busted, you know, fuck, they're never going to come back here again. More interested in the money than anything. Oh my God, how am I going to pay for my drug, drug problem? Um, yeah. And I remember getting this phone call and it was Steve Rebell and he was like, hey, just letting you know, you played an amazing set last night. Everybody was ran, raving about it. Well done, you're so amazing. I sort of wasn't even in the fucking club. I was like, gone. It's like, you know. So when people do that kind of thing, you just think, okay, I'm going to do what I do. Yeah. And were you aware that um, at this point, drugs were kind of taking over a little bit? No. No? Still kind of right? No, I, was all, I had this preconception that I was in control. Mm. And I kind of was to a certain extent. Because, you know... I was still using drugs at that point. I wasn't abusing drugs. Mm. And, and there's a really big difference between drug use and drug abuse. And this is where people always come across because people go, oh, he's got a real drug problem. And it's like, hang on. When you talk to somebody, <coughs> as I do when they, oh, I get asked, oh, I, I think I've got a problem, I'll talk to them. And, I, mm. and it works out that, you know, you have a recreational drug problem. You're, you're, you, you know, you could go to bed with drugs in your pocket and you can put them in the drawer mm. and wake up and those drugs will stay in your house or in your pocket for three days without you touching them. You're not a drug addict. Mm. You know, if you've got a problem, you won't be going to bed till you've licked that bag out. Do you get what I mean? And rang 16 other people to try and get drugs. Then, and then finally you will give in. That's the difference. And I, I kind of think, you know, back then I was just using drugs. Mm. I was using drugs to have fun. And... I just didn't know when to stop. Mm. I don't have a stop button. Mm. Yeah. But also at that time, it was quite, quite a hedonistic time anyway. So mm. I think quite a lot of people are kind of feeding into each other and that energy is... Um, I don't necessarily think it's negative. It's a positive energy. There's so much creativity, but you, there's definitely a lot going around. Yeah. Feeding into each other. And I think you're right in saying that that kind of how does that segue into addiction? Because you were certainly weren't the only person who didn't know how to stop. Mm. Yeah, there's quite a lot of people then. Oh, there were so many people that didn't have to stop. But you know what, it's really, get, it's really, um, there's this part of us that all think, oh, I'm not as bad as them. Mm. So that's always, it gives you a drive to go on. Do you get what I mean? Absolutely. Because, you, you know, you look at people and you just think, they've got a problem, I haven't. Yeah. You know, I was down to one tooth and I was still looking at people thinking, you've got a problem, yeah. I haven't. I've got great cheekbones. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, it was like, that was the insanity of it. Because what we do is, we, we build up this level in our brain that we think that we're okay. Mm. And, you know, I always say to people that, you know, however bad it got and however shit my fucking life was, it was my fucking shit. Mm. And I was comfortable in that shit because that's all I knew. You know, and, you know, that's the difference between drug use and drug abuse. And you mentioned the teeth and doing the research for this interview. That is one of the most quoted lines of yours is that you were taking your teeth out. I pulled out. my teeth out with a screwdriver. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of, like, you know, it's been in, like, quite a few magazines. But, yeah, I did. So, basically, what it is, you know, I bite my nails because of, like, the, you know, my insecurity. Like, I've always bitten my ass. Mm. So, you give me a line of coke and, or, or should I say, six grams of coke... I'm going to sit and I'm going to dig and bite my nails because that's what I would do. And I had this mental state where I would rock backwards and forwards in the chair mm. thinking that I was just, that's what I did, you know, and I would just sit and rock and I would dig and, you know, the paranoia would kick in and I would dig at my gums and, 
And what happened was, like, you know, my gums was getting fast in, like, infected. Mm. And I had a thing called, later on in the addiction, further down the line, I had my, my whole mouth was septic, which is, was called meth mouth, which is, like, a, a term they use. Where my mouth, I would sit and think that my mouth, I had animals living in my mouth. And I would be so psychotic that I would dig at them and dig at them and I would get uh, toothpicks and I'd dig in the gums and they were bleeding. But my face would be so numb from drugs, mm. I couldn't feel it. And, and all I wanted to do was get them out of my mouth, so I would pull all my teeth and snap them off and I would get pliers and get whatever was around and just dig at my mouth. And, and in the end, uh, I uh, had one tooth left at the bottom which I used to pull on all the time. And, um, and in my head, I thought I looked great. Yeah. The insane thing. But yeah, uh, and it wasn't until after I got clean uh, that I thought, oh my God, I can't walk around looking like this anymore. Because, you know, I, for the last four years of my using, I couldn't look anyone in the face. I would go to work, I would do what I did, I would lock myself in a room. And, I, you know, I never looked at the dance floor once in four years. Mm. I couldn't face people of who I'd become. And what I'd become was I would leave my house, I would go to the dealers, I would go to DJ, I would go to a chill out, I would go to DJ, I would go to a chill out, I would go DJ. Weekend would be over, I'd go back to someone's house, spend two days there and then try and go home. Mm. And that was my, that was my life. And it, it was fucking awful. It was awful. And, you know, I remember being going to see a psychiatrist to try and get into treatment and uh, I remember being with my partner James at the time and the, the, the psychiatrist said have you ever self-harmed and I was like no why would I self-harm never self-harmed and my partner was like you pulled all your teeth out and I was like that's not self-harming yeah it was like I mean and I wasn't insane <laughs> it's it's yeah it's 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 mad. Yeah. You mentioned your partner at the time, and obviously this is kind of in the later half of your addiction, but during this kind of hedonistic, um, I'm temp not tem tempted to try not to say glory days, but it is kind of this amazing mm. um, moment. People wouldn't notice, you know. What, what is anyone saying to you, Tony, too much? People always said that, but I don't have to fuck them off. Yeah. You know, anyone that got come along, that was like, kind of got in the way of my using or the way of my partying, yeah. got fucked off. They got moved on really quickly. You know, I had, at one point, I had this, like, castle of people around me. Uh, and I remember my friend saying to me, you know, to get hold of you, you have to go through six different people. Mm. And, it, and it kind of was like that in the 90s. And I kind of had, like, this group of girls and this group of other people that reinforced who, who and what I was doing and made it OK mm. because they were doing it as well. And, you know, when you go back in history and you see... I'm not comparing myself to these people, but, you know, you look at Warhol and the factory. They're all on drugs. It's one person being surrounded by stuff. And, and, and this is what we create. We create ways and means to do who, what we want, when we want. And we have so many yes people and so many people that will tell you you're fucking amazing and will tell you that you ain't got a drug problem because they're feeding off of it. Mm. They're buying into it. And that's kind of what we create. You know, as an addict, it's not all bad. You know, we're, we're, we're some of the most manipulating cunts on this planet. You know, I, I can, you know, I hate that the shit terms like, I could sell snow to an Eskimo, fuck off. Do you know what I mean? But I, I literally, I can manipulate anything. And mm. Because it was survival. It was survival. And... Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that you were kind of pushing people away at this point and uh. just telling everyone to fuck off if they weren't on your side. But you yeah. have had some really, really long-standing friends throughout all yeah. of this. Kate, you've been friends with for over 30 years. No, I'm, I'm very blessed to have uh, so many incredible friends in the sense that friends that I've had for life. Mm. You know, I could sit here and I could reel off 20 names. Um, of people that are in my life for a reason. And I could reel off 10 people that are in my life because I choose them to be in my mm. life. Um, and those, out of that 10, they're just, you know, they're people that have stood by me. They're people that have backed off when they needed to back off. 
because they couldn't be a part of what I was doing. And then when I got clean, they came back into my life for a reason. Um, yeah, I'm blessed in that sense. Because, you know, it got really dark. It got really, really, really dark. And the last thing you need is a friend mm. at that point in time. You need, you, you, you need associates at that point in time when it's so dark because you're, those people around you, you want around you because they're on your level. Mm. It's not till you get taken out of that and made to look back in on it and that you actually realise, oh, my God, these people aren't my friends. I'm, I've got a friend called Lawrence Manis and... He said to me one night, you wouldn't piss on these people if they were on fire. What the fuck are you doing with them? Mm. And it resonated with me. It was like, I just looked around and I just thought, fuck off, I wouldn't piss on you. And what he was doing was just like saying to me, what are you doing? And of course, you know, how dare you insult my friends? They weren't my friends, they were users. Mm. Those people, the, good, the, the, the most amazing thing about getting clean in the beginning is those cunts jump ship. They're off in different, they're like rats up a drain, but they're gone. Mm. Because you're no longer that, the supplier, you're no longer the party. And that moment of clarity when you realise you're no longer the party is, 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 is it's, it's a, a gift from God. It really is. It's like, oh my God, I'm not the party. The weight off your shoulders. It really is, you know, yeah. because, you know, for years you think, you know, this is my castle, you're all living in it, fuck off. <laughs> Insane. I want to talk a little bit about um, music because mm. I feel like for you it's very much um, kind of a time machine. It can take you back to beautiful moments yeah. in your life. And there's one song that keeps coming up, No More Drama, Mary J. Blige. Yeah, so it's... Uh, I'll say this about crying. And Mary J. Blige, that album, the No More Drama album, was... I see, my hair's a standard name, doesn't it? <laughs> It's very rare that people get into that. You know, for me, that album and that track, you know, I listen to that track every day for two years, every day. That and The Soldiers of Twilight Fade because they were the two of the tracks I was going to have at my funeral. And, you know, for me, all I ever thought, you know, without sounding melodramatic, but that's all I ever thought about was death. Every day, I didn't think about, oh, where I'm going next week, what I'm going to do, how amazing this holiday is going to be, mm. I'm going to get those shoes. I thought about who's coming to my funeral, who I don't want at my funeral, who's going to be in the front row, uh, the songs, and, and, you know, I was going to be brought into Womack and Womack, footsteps on the dance floor, teardrops, mm. and I was going to be burnt, no more drama. Because, in other words, that song just changed everything for me. It's like, you know... I would sit and listen to it over and over and over again psychotically. And I remember having it, you know, that was it for me. And, the, and then there's this track called Believe by um, Soldiers of Twilight, not Fade, Believe. And the words to it were like, if you, if you believe you're halfway there. And it kind of just, just, that was it. That changed my life, that track. Because, you know, music has that ability. It can not only transport you from the darkest place into the most happiest of memories, it can also, you, all you have to do is close your eyes and put on a certain track and somebody who's no longer with us that are in that room with you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it can take you from wherever despair you are to give you hope. And that's what the, the, the most incredible thing about music. You know, we, we think and we moan and we, oh, I've got this, and this is going wrong for me, I don't have this. You know what, with music, you have so much. And, it, you know... You know, I'm not talking about starving children or anything, but what I'm talking about is emotionally, when you're emotionally bankrupt and you, there's certain tracks that you play, it, it, you know, it fills you with joy. Mm. It's a fucking incredible thing. That's an incredible thing. You know, uh, and I, you know I used to say, oh, I'm so lucky to do what I do. I'm not, I'm not lucky. I'm not lucky to be alive. I'm blessed. Fucking blessed to be on this planet, man. Mm. Mm. Because I did everything in my power not to be here. I tried to kill myself on a daily basis, you know, by the drugs that I took, the amount of drugs that I took, um, the amount of situations I got into. Uh, none of it was, oh, I'm doing this for a better life. <laughs> I'm doing this, you know, everything's going to be great in two weeks' time. And it wasn't. It, there, was, there was only one ending, and that was I was going to die. And I knew that. And, and that's why... I listen to it and, you know, I, 
what through my job and through the it's not a comeback you know people keep saying oh you've made a real comeback in the last but I never really went away my, that, that part of my life went away you know and mm. I've through the last 13 years of being sober so much has come into my life because I've grafted for it again and I, I worked with Mary J Blige on so many occasions and the first time I worked with her I, I was like I went up to her and I was like I told her the story and she started to cry that's amazing and she was like that person wasn't you. And I was like, no. And she was like, no, the person that stands before me was, is you. She was like, that wasn't you. And it was just like, you know. And that's the power of, of recovery for, for, for me because I was going to be buried to that song, burnt to that song. And, you know, and then I'm standing over that conversation nine years later with Mary J. Blige. Do you know? That's recovery. Yeah. Redemption. Mm, majorly. Amazing. You know, and I, I've actually just started listening to the track again. Have you? Not because I'm thinking about death. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah. Well, that's yeah, I've had enough now. No, literally, I started listening to it. <clears throat> it's really weird. Someone gave me um, a playlist of theirs to listen to a couple of weeks ago. And on it was that track. Because I said to them, OK, I want you to go away and I want you to come back and give me 30 tracks that sum up my life. And that was, that was on there. And I was like, oh, my God, this person knows. They know, you know. They know. <laughs> they got the clue. What's the song that kind of sums up this ballsy 18-year-old with a loud mouth on King's Road? I couldn't tell you. Street Life by the Crusaders. That's a good one. That is a good yeah, one. that was kind of the first track I ever bought. And I kind of just loved it. Do you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. Yeah, that kind of sums that up, that, that era for me, of, for me, of who I was, not the era of what it was. Mm. Just kind of takes you back to that moment. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be Karma Chameleon, that's for sure. <laughs> 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 and let's talk about um, kind of the rehabilitation process, because uh -huh. you're a big fan of the 12 step. Yeah. Um, and you do an amazing job at kind of promoting that um, and making sure that anyone else who's suffering mm. knows that as a kind of vessel. Um, and the last phase of that is, I believe it's the last phase, you can tell me if I'm wrong, is um, kind of uh, forgiveness as well as spreading the word of that. Yeah, the 12-step you know, program, the, the steps are in, in, in 1 to 12 for a reason. So, you know, a lot of people get clean and then they, they're like, oh, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that, but I'll do that. Mm. And it doesn't work that way, and, you know. So for me, I talk about the 12-step program because it changed my life and it works for me. It enables me to be who I am today. It enables me to have freedom. Mm -hmm. It enables me to go and do my job and hold my head up high and leave my job when I need to. I don't need to stay and I don't need to do that. You know, it, it, it gives me self-respect. That program, that 12-step program has given me hope. It's given me belief. And, you know, it works. I'm, I'll be 13 years in, in, on January the 10th. And that's fucking... It makes me want to cry because, you know, it's insane. I, I'm 13 years without a drink or a drug. Uh, and I, I went 28 years without drinking water. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I just, like, you know, I thought you used to think there was water in Jack Daniels. It was distilled, made from distilled spring water. That was the kind of, like... That was where I was getting that's my water. hydration. That was it, yeah, that was literally it. But, you know, um, you know, 13 years and... And I remember, you know, being in my drug dealer's house, right? And because uh, I'm writing, a, we're writing this book, and this book's not about my stories of what I've done with other people. Mm. The book's about the stories of what they've done with me. So we're going to ex-boyfriends, we're going to people that hate me, whose lives I shattered, which, you know, there was an awful lot of people in my using and in my sobriety that are, I've, I've hurt through my addictions. Mm. And, um... I want to give them a chance to tell people of what I, how I treated them and what I was like instead of me giving this story of like how amazing this was and amazing that was and how bad that was. That's my, that's my truth, but not necessarily their truth. Mm. So I, with this book, we're getting other people to tell their stories and um, it's kind of really empowering. And, you know, because without the 12-step program, I'm fucked. It doesn't work for everyone. Mm. There are so many other ways of getting clean and so many other ways of staying clean. But for me, it works, and it works brilliantly. And, you know, the, 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 the power of it is the fact that the majority of my friends are now clean. 
Because what we do is we lead by example. I don't go up to people and say, in the early days, don't get me wrong, I used to say, oh, you've got a drug problem. You need me to help you. <laughs> now you know that you've I mean? seen the light. <laughs> yeah, you know, oh, you know, I remember my, one of my friends calling me St. Tony. And, you know, it was like, fuck off. But, you know, it's like, I'll help someone when they ask for help. And I'll, and I'll go to them and I'll give them options. Because, mm. you know, like they were given to me. And whether they take those options there or then, it's very unlikely. But what you are doing when you go and speak to that person is planting the seed. And then as long as you tell them in a non-judgmental way, I'm here for you, I've got the same problem as you, they'll come to you and they'll ask you at some point. There's always that two o'clock moment, 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m., I can't do this anymore, mm. I need to call someone. My phone's always on. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Don't fucking call me at 6 a.m. to tell me you've got a drug problem. Two days later, be back on it, because that will really fuck me off. But if, you want a pro if you've got a problem, then I'll help you with it. And that, you know, not a lot... Well, I, you know, it's an anonymous programme. Mm. You know, so a lot of people don't like to talk about it, because you're breaking traditions and stuff. For me, I think it's really important that I talk about it, because people need to know. Because, you know, people come in at different chapters of your life, and they think that... You wouldn't, you know, I have people say to me all the time, you don't know what it's like for me. I'm like, what? And they're like, you don't know what it's like for me. You don't know what it's like to, to be living on the streets. You don't know what it's like to be turning tricks for fucking drugs. And I'm like, are you fucking mental? Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'll probably suck more cock for rocks than you've had at dinners, but you know, that's life. But what it is is, because they see you on that chapter or they see you on Instagram or they see you in this place, they don't really relatively know that stuff. So for me, it's really important that I, I let people know that stuff. Mm. I, don't, I, I hid under a rock for many a year and now I'm clean, I don't need to do that anymore. And I think the more people that know that there is a way and there's help for free, you don't have to pay to get clean. Do you get what I mean? Mm. The re you, you know, you get the rewards from it for, for nothing, it's incredible. It's incredible. Is there, is there a music moment you had as soon as you realised you were kind of in the clear, so to speak? Did you change what you were listening to? Did you stop listening to certain songs? I stopped hanging out with cunts. <laughs> that was kind of like the, 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 the magical moment of like thinking, oh my God, I don't need to do this anymore. And um, yeah, I mean, but you know what? It kind of just, it keeps evolving. Mm. You know, it keeps evolving. Like I said before, I've just started listening to Mary J. Blige again. Yeah. You know, it, it... I don't ever think, oh, my God. I know, hand on heart, that I won't use a drink or a drug tomorrow. I know that in January I'll be 13 years clean. I know, hand on heart, that I will never use again. I can say that today. Mm. Regardless, I've had some really bad stuff happen to me in recovery. I've lost family members. I've lost loved ones. And I never ever thought, oh God, I need a drink. Because I know if I have a drink or I have a drug, it's all over. I wouldn't even turn up for their funeral. I'd be off making excuses, mm. lying. Because that's where it goes for me. It will go straight back to that point. So for me, I know that. But what will take me out of my behaviours, the way I treat myself, the way I treat other people. Um, I... See, I don't just have a problem with drink or drugs, I have a problem in other areas of addiction as well. Because what happens is it shifts. And so I have a, a problem with sex addiction, I have a problem with love addiction, I have a problem with fucking food, I have a problem with you, I have a problem with me, I have a problem with sushi. If I have it on a Monday, I want it Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Got it. If I go to Pizza Express on a Sunday and have a, a salad and well, suddenly I'm having it delivered every fucking day. You know, buy one pair of shoes, oh, they're great, let me get them in every colour. Goes back to that predisposed notion that you were talking about at the beginning. Yeah, always, and you know, uh, and it doesn't. It's always, always trying to fix, trying to, you know, it, within the twelve-step program, they, you know, some, you know, you have these cliches, <laughs> and one of them is that one is too many and a thousand's never enough, and it's so fucking true, it's so true, and I have to remember that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I have to remember that when I go to the cupboard and 16 pairs of trainers fall out that I've never worn. Do you know what I mean? It's I like, do. it's obscene, but you know. But you're in the clinic now, you're doing well. I'd Fantastic. love to sit here and say I'm okay 
and never be okay. <laughs> okay, okay, don't cut it for me. It's like saying nice. Nice. Oh, nice. Oh, that's nice. Nice is what? What a cunting word is Rubbish nice. Word. Oh, that's nice. It's like such an insult. No, you know what? Okay and nice don't cut it. I, on a good day, I'm good. Okay. And on a bad day, I'm okay. -ish. Okay ish. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of DJing now um, mm. and how that differs because you're in, as we've been saying, you're in such that nucleus of creativity, DJing yeah. amongst the fashion great, seeing all this incredible stuff being created yeah. around you. And now you're very much back in the fashion scene, DJing mm -hmm. um, in that world. And I'm really interested to know how it feels in both scenarios. It's, so much has changed, they're completely different polarized mm. worlds. Um, and how does that kind of affect you and your work? And it, it, to answer the first part of the question, how does it feel? It feels amazing. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I truly, truly know what, what happiness is, is again. Because for me, playing music and being, playing it for the right reasons is, is fucking incredible. And yeah, the fashion stuff, you know, fucking Donatella's living room the other week, you know what I mean? It's like, and you know, I've been playing for like the House of Versace again and, and you know, just incredible stuff. You know, I can't go into the amount of people that I've worked for in this last year alone. And, uh, and sometimes I, I go home and I think, I'm going to get found out. I, I, <laughs> seriously, I, I, I sit there and I think, one day I'm going to get found out. They're going to all realise that I'm such a fake because that's what, how my addict head works. Mm. I'll, be, I'll be on a, pl a plane going to work for, like, to Miami to do David Beckham or whatever, and I, I sat on that plane the whole way to Miami a few months ago thinking, they're all going to hate me when I get there. They're going to hate what I play. Not the fact that I'm flying and they're paying me, you know, but my head will tell me that you're shit. You don't deserve to be here. Do you know what I mean? Because that's my, how my addict head works. But, you know, the ability of my program kicks in and I just think, yeah, I am worth it today. I have a purpose today. You know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm more than capable of being an amazing person. I have to remember that. You know, and the job's just, you know, it hasn't just happened overnight. It's, it's 13 years of, of regaining who I am. Hard graft. It has been, you know, because people go, oh, the last, last 18 months really kicked off for you. And it's just like, it's taken 13 years to, to get to this point of, of actually starting to love myself again in the sense that I believe in myself. So therefore, when you believe in yourself, someone's going to believe in you. Mm. You know, it's like RuPaul says, you can't love, you know, that, <laughs> that one liner at the end is, yeah. you don't love yourself, nobody else is going to love It's true. It's so true. Another 12 stepper, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I sometimes I pinch myself when I'm doing these jobs and I just think, you know, crazy. And you know, there's been other times where I've been in, <laughs> I've been in first class on a plane and my bed wouldn't go down and I've kicked off like some fucking old bitch. Do you know what I mean? Like, how dare you? But I was picking up 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I was picking up dog butts outside Vogue House picking up dog butts out, so Vogue House, because they, they had that thing on the wall where they, people would come out on their brakes and put long cigarettes in. That was my thinking. I knew where to go to get longer cigarette butts. Today I'm working for those people. And that's... I don't ever, ever think, oh... I don't take that for granted. Mm. I, 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 I just... I truly know how blessed I am. And I truly, you know... I don't think, oh, well, fuck you. Yeah, you, you know, you just... Uh, uh, you know... I deserve to be doing this. I don't think like that. I, I, I you know, because I always know that there's always someone who's a quarter of my age that's going to take that job. But you know what? I do my job and I do it in a way that I, I don't play music. I read a crowd. I read a room, mm. and that's that's a gift. You know, I, I walk into a room and I don't sit at home compiling music of what I'm going to play. I take a bag of thirty sticks. People look at me like I'm, in, I'm insane, well, I am. <laughs> uh, I will read that room and I, will, I know where everything is on everything. And uh, I will read that room and, and that's what I do, why I've stood the test of time and why I'm doing everything at the moment. And for the next, I'm not going anywhere. So the moment's the wrong word to use. But, you know, 
That's why things are progressing the way they are, yeah. because I, I, I believe in myself again. Do you feel like you have to read the room slightly diff differently now in this Instagram age? Oh, totally, 100%. You know, so, it's, it's, someone came up to me the other day and actually said, oh, I didn't even realise you were a real DJ. I was like, oh, I really wanted to punch the cunt in the face. But, you know, but what do you expect? Because I, I post shit on Instagram all day. Yeah. So therefore they see me being funny on Instagram and, and they think that the DJ word at the beginning is just a name. Mm. Um, you, you, yeah, it's, it's social media. You have to be really careful about who you want to be on social media. You really do. Mm. Do you get know what I mean? Because I have days where I can be a complete cunt and I'll post a load of really negative shit. And then the next day I'll be posting like some really positive <laughs> shit. And then that, what that does is it makes me look like I'm completely fucking in, uh, unhinged again. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really... If you come up to me and you tell me you like my Instagram, I'm going to tell you, thank you so much. I'm not going to say fuck off. Because you know what? Someone's took the time to come up and they read that stuff every day and they look at that stuff. I'm fucking... I'm winning. I'm winning. Mm. If someone come up to me and said, oh, you know, your Instagram's a load of shit, I'd be winning too, because it is. <laughs> but you know what? It's my shit. But, you know, um, yeah, through the job, you know, it all goes hand in hand today. And that's kind of like where we lose the creativity. Because mm. we're so busy worrying about what to post, when to post it, who's going to like it, blah, 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 algorithms, blah, 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 you know. Um, that are the you worried about that? Huh? Are you worried about that? Fuck off, am I? <laughs> you know what I mean? But the kids are, the kids are, this yeah. is just it, you know. I, I uh, have like, because um, I do like my own club nights, I do like a, run club, you know, I do parties and stuff. So I have this team and, you know, I'll say, right, post this. And they're like, no, not till 1pm. 1, 1 and I'm like, what? Fucking post it. And they're like, no, not till 1 or 5. Five's the best time to post. It's like, it's fucking Facebook and Instagram. Just post it. It's like, <laughs> I know nothing, apparently. Got it. Which I, I quite like not knowing nothing. That's good. Yeah. Um, you said you're not going anywhere. Um, no, and a good thing forward. To, a good thing, too, because... Um, I recently read that you have been kind of dubbed as British club culture's national treasure. <laughs> they can fuck off. <laughs> I'm fucking national treasure. What am I like, Dame Forehead? <laughs> no, you know what? Look, I've been around a long time, and I'm, and you know, I when I was 27, I, I, I all I thought, you know, I, I remember saying to my mum, I don't want to be, I never wanted to live beyond 27, and my mum went, 27 is an amazing age, and I remember her saying it to me, and I just thought. I don't want to live on that. And when I got to 28, I was really fucked off. But, you know, it's like today, um, I spent a lifetime lying about my age as well. Mm. Just tell everyone, when I was 14, I used to tell everyone I was 18. And then when I was, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, I remember when I got with David, my partner at the moment, I got with him and I, I was 33. I've been with him seven years. I'm actually 53. But, you know, um, and I remember him finding, he had to ask me, a password and it was my date of birth and he and I told him it and he rang me back an hour later and went, you took but hang on what, what was that and I had to lie again <laughs> and then it, it was actually my 50th birthday and I had like and it was the first time in my life that I embraced being 50 I thought it's amazing because it's such an achievement mm. do you know what I mean I'm still 16 I'm, I'm still that age that I started using drugs and started getting drunk that's what my mental age ended do you know what I mean? Because when you start doing drink and drugs and you start going into addiction, it's like being in a jam jar. You know, you put this lid on and you're going round and round. And time really does stand still. It really does. Because what happens is, although we're manipulating and we're cunning and we're baffling and we're all of those things in addiction, we stop learning. All we learn is how to survive. So beyond that, we, we don't read books. I remember a friend of mine who's still using, bless his heart, who's like, like, he's like me, like I was 13 years ago, he's got no teeth. Mm. And he was one of my best friends and, you know, I, I'll always love him, but he, I remember him saying, people like us don't go on holiday. And it's always resonated with me, it's always like, so you know what, I, I, you know, I make the most, of, I, I do go on holiday today. And, and, I, and when I'm on a plane, it always is in my brain that he's, people like us don't travel. Do you know what I mean? And mm. you know what? People like us can travel. 
people like us can go on holiday and people can, like us can fucking live a clean, amazing life and, and re reap the rewards from that. You know, without saying, sounding like I'm trying to change the world, you know, I changed my world and that's enough. Do you get what I mean? It's like, that's more than enough. Because, yeah, I was, I'd, I'd be dead. I'd be dead, I would be dead. I wouldn't be sitting here doing this. I would have been de dead, hopefully not forgotten, but I would be dead if, it, if I didn't have that moment of clarity where somebody said to me, well, my partner James said to me, I was in the, in the cross rocking backwards and forwards in King's Cross and he came in and he said to me, what happened to you? That was it, it was like this moment of clarity. I couldn't answer the question. And then I was three months later in rehab for a year. You know, I had to go away for a fucking year. Uh, it's insane. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. But now this is your legacy. Huh? But now this is your legacy. Yeah, totally. You've created a new one. Yeah, I have. And you know, people always say, oh, what's the best gig you've done? <laughs> so, I've asked that being asked so much lately. Oh, what's the best party you've ever done? And, and not, it's not happened yet. Because I know that I'm not going to be suddenly stopping what I'm doing. Because mm. I love it too much. Do you know what I mean? And when you love something, you make it work. DJ Fatoni, thank you so much for talking to me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.